Let's drop down to uh, 11 verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Is it possible to please God without faith? His word clearly says it is not. What did we say faith was? When we, we tackled this the first, the first time when we talked about now faith is the substance of things hoped for. In fact, there's your definition, things that are hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But what was the thing that we brought out that faith requires? Faith is something you believe before you see. Okay. That's half true. Um, because people have Belief in, in faith in, in different things. But Bible faith is based upon the promise of God. God says something, I believe it. Then it comes. Then it comes into visibility. Then it comes into manifestation, right? If you don't have the promise, you can't have the faith. These people that say that they believe that they have faith in God and they don't believe the word, they don't have faith in God. They have faith in something else, Right? At least that's what the scripture says. And I'm going to go with the scripture every time. I'm going to go with the scripture. Because if you don't go with the, with the scripture, you're going to be sidetracked, right? Verse 6 says, but, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You believe all that? you got to believe all that. If you're going to be his child, if you're going to be in this covenant, you've got to believe that God is a rewarder to them that diligently seek him. I'm going to skip over Noah. And we're going to go to verse 8. By faith... Now, I skipped over Noah because we already did Noah and we already did Enoch, right? Uh, So, verse 8. By faith... Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. In other words, he was called. He didn't know where God was was calling him to, but, but he responded. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. What's, what's the, the promise? The, the promise is the promise that was the covenant promises that were made to Abram. And we're going to look into that in more detail. But what this reveals is that the promise was not only to Abram, but it was also to Isaac and Jacob. You see that? He dwelled in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, comma, and then he adds, the heirs with him of the same promise. I recently uh, sold my Prius. I didn't really sell it because I didn't get any money for it. But on the, uh, the title deed, I wrote my son's name and my grandson's name. Who's the owner? Yes. Well, I was the owner. In fact, Laura's name was on that too. So together, we had to both sign it because we were both the owners, right? You can't say one is the owner and the other one's not. They're both on the title. And it's free and clear. There's no lien on it. But here, what this is saying is, Abram got the promise, but Isaac and Jacob were fellow heirs with him of the same promise. That's really important when you, when you think about this. You know what Jesus did for you? When he called you into himself, when you became a Christian, when you became part of the body of Christ, you became fellow heirs with him. In other words, what he gets, you get. Now, there's probably to a lesser degree because we're going to be judged and received according to you know, what we've done in, in, in our bodies right? while we were here. And there'll be all kinds of rewards. 
But you get rewards based on first that you're in the family of God, that you're a part of the body of Christ, and you are joint heirs with him. Well, that's what I say. Isaac and Jacob are joint heirs. Isaac was Abram's son, and then Jacob was Isaac's son. And you can see it's passing down, right? Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. Well, why is it passing down? Because Abram's going to die. And then Isaac's around, right? But Isaac, need, and Isaac needs to pass it down too because he's going to die. And then Jacob needs to pass it down to his children, right? And that's the way it goes. Now, the good news is Jesus ain't going to die. He already did all the dying he's going to do. Amen. And, you know, if you think about it, you got to get your mind on this. You've already done the dying you're going to do. You may face trials. You may face trial. I mean, I don't know what's going to. You may face trials at the time of what, with physically, what they say, the time of your death. You may be in the hospital. You could be racked in pain. I don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. But don't look at it like, oh, I got to die. Because it is appointed to every man once to die. Right? Then comes the judgment. Now, isn't it true that you must die before you are born again? Right? Water baptism. That's a perfect symbol. That's what we're going to read. That's the main reason we do it, right? I think, well, the main reason is it's commanded. <laughs> right? But when you dunk down, you're what? You're in the watery grave. You come up, you're born again, right? Now, we read this verse 10 last time as well. And when we get to verse 11, we're going to, good night, we're going to uh, get into uh, uh, something we haven't talked about, and that's Sarah. Verse 10, still talking about Abram, for he, or actually it says Abraham here, right? Because, uh, at the time he received the beginning of the promises, he, his name was Abram, for he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Did that, did that city exist somewhere in the promised land? What's that city he's looking for? How about the New Jerusalem? That one he saw in Revelation. Where anybody was here when we, we looked in Revelation, we looked at the holy golden city. Where we're headed for, it says here, Abram was looking for the city all the way back then. I don't know the extent to his insight, but I do know this. God called him a prophet. He said he was a prophet. He told uh, uh, the Pharaoh, right, uh, I don't know if we'll get into that, but uh, tonight, the, the, uh, I told the Pharaoh, because remember, the Pharaoh took Abraham's wife, Sarah, into his uh, harem. And before he could sleep with her, God spoke to the Pharaoh in a dream and said, you give this, wife, this man's wife back to him because this man is a prophet. We know he was a prophet. And we know the things that he did. Abraham's life was all prophetic. In fact, you'll find out when, you, when we go through some of this. Abraham's life was prophetic. Isaac's life was prophetic. Jacob's life was prophetic. Joseph's life was prophetic. David's life was prophetic. There's a lot of them, right? And a lot of them appear right here. We already saw Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. In verse 11, we're going, to get, we're going to mention Sarah, but I want to we'll say one more thing on this. Did, was Abraham's other children, because he had lots of other children, he had, an, he had another wife after Sarah was gone. He was, a, when she died, when she was 120 or something, he, he remarried and had five more kids. Right? 
And he also had kids with uh, Ish- uh, the Ishmael was born, right? But you notice Ishmael's not in here. Midian's not in here, which was one of uh, one of uh, uh, the children of uh, what was her name Keturah. <clears throat> it comes from. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's where the blessing... Those are the heirs of the promise. So when the Muslims tell you that the promise came through Ishmael, in spite of how blessed it seemed, they seem to be, I mean, these people are a multitude, right? These people look like they are so blessed of God. Because multiplying, multiplying, multiplying. And God, that God actually said he was going to multiply them. But what they're believing is wrong. I don't know if Muhammad was a complete fraud or if he was a prophet. But if he was a prophet for real, he was a false prophet. I don't know if he had a supernatural visitation like he claimed. Or if he just made it up, or if the, you know, one of the uh, teachings is that uh, the Catholic Church back then had influence and wanted to create a, another religion to do their bidding, and to, to actually to kill people who would, were, would not go to Rome. So I don't, I don't know what you think about that, but uh, oh, my point is, if the Quran is Muhammad's work, and that's what makes him a prophet. And you look at the Quran and it says, God has no son. That, that ends it right there for me. I don't need to read any more of the Quran. Amen. Uh-huh. One of these books has to be right. Right? And this book says, it goes from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and skipped completely over Ishmael. And that kind of, you know... It, if I, if I could take the Quran, just flush it down the commode. Because I don't need, I certainly don't need it, neither does anybody else in this world actually need it. Satan has taken advantage of the situation and deceived them, which I believe will, uh, we, may, we may get there tonight. I'm not sure how far we're going to get. Verse 11, and this is really where we want to go. Now we're talking about things new. Through faith, also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Now I heard a preacher talking about this and he said that it wasn't Sarah's faith, it was Abram's faith. I think it was their joint faith. Because if it was just Abram's faith that helped her, it caused her to receive strength to conceive, why does it say she judged him faithful who had promised? That's God, right? It says Sarah judged God as the faithful one, going to be faithful to his promise. I believe she is one of the faith heroes in, in this hall of faith. Or Hall of Fame, if you want to call it that. So when you consider Abraham, you got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then you got Sarah in there too. So let's go to Genesis. Genesis is a big book. Uh, Verse 1. We just got through reading about Sarah. And now all of a sudden we got somebody named Sarai. It's the same person. Because Sarai's name is going to be changed to Sarah. But it hasn't been changed as of this point. Anyway, Genesis chapter 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's, not Abraham, his name hasn't been changed yet either. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, Bear him no children. And she had a handmaid 
an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, or Abram, Behold now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing. Blaming God. Right? I don't think it was God that was restraining her. Maybe it was. It was, seemed like there was some type of physical ailment that she had to be healed of. Because it had to be a miracle. Anyway, Sarah said, Behold, the Lord, now the Lord has restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. I think he made a mistake. <clears throat> And think about this. If she hadn't have done that, or if he would have said, no, I don't need to do that. God is going to provide a child through you. He's going to recognize this marriage. I don't have to go around and do that. But he didn't, he didn't stand up for it. She didn't stand up for it. And so they had an Ishmael. And without an Ishmael, there wouldn't be a Muhammad and an Islam. And there wouldn't be all these massacring. Today, we have massacring of Christians. We have people that are afraid all over the world because of the, the Islamic or Muslim terrorists. Now, I'm not saying that all Muslims are all Islam. Answer to that. In fact, um, I think I've, I've shared with you, my, my manager is, uh, he's a Muslim and I think he's, he said, well, yeah, that's very few of them. If you, you know, very few of them actually have those beliefs. Well, that's okay. Then the other, what, 90% that don't believe that should stand up against them. And say, this is not the Islam we believe in. But they're all afraid of them too. But here, whose fault is it? Remember, you know, you could blame Sarai. Because she's the one that said, do it, right? But when Adam was enticed with the fruit, who did God blame? Adam. Adam. So it's, I don't think it's Sarai's fault. She's been trying to have a child now for 10 years. Well, probably longer than that, but I mean, since the, since the first promise, since he was first told. And after 10 years, she gives up. Sarai, verse 3, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. This is not a concubine According to the scripture, Abram was her husband. It says that she's his wife. So he's got two wives. She's legitimately, even though she's still a slave girl, she's legitimately another wife. God didn't tell him to to marry another wife, right? Right? But he just did it. He, he didn't, I don't think he had any guilt about it. He just did it. And he produced Ishmael. And all the problems since. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. Well, it doesn't look like the problem was, was with Abram, right? She conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived... Her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. And Abram's like, Hey, behold, Thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleases thee. In other words, she's still your maid servant. She's still your servant. 
even though she's conceived, do whatever seems right to you. It's your maid. It's your it's your handmaid. So when Sarai dealt hardly with her, I believe it's harshly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, this is the angel talking, Hagar, Sarah's maid. You notice when it comes to her relationship with God and the angelic beings, it's not Hagar, but Hagar, Sarai's maid. See, Abram has a covenant, and evidently Sarai has a covenant because she's the one going to produce the child, promised seed, right? But this Hagar, she doesn't have a covenant with God, not yet. He says, hey, hey, you, Hagar, Sarah's maid, Sarah's maid, whence comes thou, or where, from where did you come from? And where are you going? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Now, this angel of the Lord, whoever it is, whatever it is, is talking in the first person for God. It doesn't mean it's God standing there. He sent his messenger. The word angel actually means a messenger. But the angel, speaking as if from the Lord, the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly that it shall not be numbered for multitude. Have you looked around on the earth? Who was multiplied? They're all over the place. They surround Jerusalem. They're in Arabia. They're they're all over. They have four wives, and yeah, they're allowed. I think it's four wives, I think. Yeah. I don't know if there's a limit. Anyway, did God keep his promise to, to uh, Hagar? Now, they, they think, well, look how God has blessed us. And God has blessed because of this book, because of these words, not because of Muhammad's writings. In fact, Satan sees that God said he was going to magnificently multiply them. It's without number. A great multitude. And Satan is sitting there going, they can't help but be multiplied. God said it. I'm going to weave my little plan to take advantage of this promise because God's going to bless them, but they'll think they're being blessed because of following Islam, the teaching of Islam. Satan's not an idiot. He's not stupid. He comes up with some good or some strategic plans. And anyone that's actually run into conflicts in their life, you can stand back sometimes and you can, you can see how Satan wove that into your life. Let's put it this way. He's bad, but he's a good enemy. Skilled. He's a skilled enemy. Very skilled. Well, he's been doing it for how long? Millions. We don't know how long, because we know that the earth is about 6,000 years old, although scientists you know, will, will say, no, that's not true. But according to the Bible, it's about 6,000 years old. And we know he's been messing around with mankind ever since Adam and Eve in the garden. But we know he led a rebellion in heaven before that. And a third of the angels were deceived. He is a bad dude. And he's been around playing his cards. The youth group downstairs is in the, in the room playing cards. So maybe that's why I thought of it. There's nothing wrong with playing cards. It's just a game. 
but Satan was no money's involved. No money's involved. But Satan knows how to play his cards. In fact, yes, I'm sure some people go to Las Vegas and, and they pray. They think they're praying to God. Oh God, if you let me win the blackjack, I don't think God is blessing blackjack. <laughs> Now, I'm, I could be wrong. I mean, if somebody comes out there, they, they were on vacation, and they put a little money on, the black, on black or red or whatever, and they won, and they kept winning, and then they took that money and, and did something for God, how am I going to say, well, you know, I, I don't know. I, I can't judge it. I'm not going to judge it. You don't do that. But I'm not so sure that that's the way God was going to meet your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus, right? Verse 11, the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child. She knew that, (laughs) right? And shalt bear a son and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard thy affliction. And he, watch this prophecy. And then think about what's going on in the world. He will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Well, they do kind of all dwell together around their brothers, right? But Isaac's also the brother. So here's Isaac's. Isaac has Jacob. You have Israel, right? And who surrounds them? Their brothers. Their brothers. And who? I mean, there's the word. The word says he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Now, I know Israel would rather that they leave. But don't look like they're going anywhere unless God gives them a, a kick out. You know, eventually they will be out of that land because Israel has to inherit that land. That's prophecy. That's promise. And he and she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her. You, you see it's L-O-R-D capital. She called the name of, actually what this says is she called the name of Jehovah. Or Yahweh, if you want to say it that way, Yahweh. That spake unto her. In other words, she called upon the true God. There's no way you can take take that and say the she called upon the name of Allah. That that's not God's name. She it says right here she called upon Jehovah. It just doesn't say Jehovah, but if you look in the Hebrew, that's what it says. And she called the name the Lord then that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore, the well was called Berlahiroi. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bare Abram a son. We knew it was going to happen. Obviously, Hagar returned. And Abram, so Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare Ishmael. Well, how how did he know to call him Ishmael? I mean, Hagar knew, but he called he called him Ishmael. And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. Who can do the math? What's fourscore and six? 86? That's right. He was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. But that wasn't the one. He still got to wait for a while, right? So let's go to the next chapter, chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, no, now he's 99. So he was 86. Three would be 89. So it's 13 years, right? Which kind of makes sense because Ishmael is going to be circumcised when he's 13 years old. Okay. So Abram is 90 years 
old and nine. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am. Did you ever notice how many times in the New Testament Jesus said, I am? A lot. Did you know he was identifying with God when God said, I am? He said, I am too. He was God. That's because he was God manifested in the flesh. When he said, I am, it's the same as God saying, I am. It was a, a reference of deity. Cryptic, I, I'll agree, it's cryptic. You can't, you, you know, you can't open the Bible here and show, and show anybody and say, well, see, here, here he, he claimed to be God. I am the Almighty God. Jesus said, I am. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Is it possible? Can Abram actually walk before God and be made perfect? Be thou perfect. Right, right there, he's, fa- he's going to fail. Why? Because Abram's a sinner. In fact, sometimes we get this idea that God chose Abram. In fact, there are preachers that will teach this. Or you, you, if you be careful when you get a commentary, you, you read some of these ideas about this stuff, and they'll say, well, you know, Abram was chosen because he was the most righteous individual on the earth. It was special. He worshipped the sun, the moon, and the stars back in Ur of the Chaldees before God got his attention. Remember his brother? We haven't gotten to Laban, but remember his brother had the household gods? (laughs) Which Rachel stole? Anyway... Be thou perfect. Well, he can't be perfect, but, but this is where we see that God is going to, if he obeys God and he believes God, God is going to impute to Abram righteousness. And this is important because that's how we get saved. We, are, we have righteousness imputed to us. Yes, God, God would say to you, be thou perfect. In fact, doesn't it say, be thou holy as he is holy? And you're like, I can't do that. Well, that's what Romans tell, is all about in the beginning, right? It tells, tells you, you can't do it. Paul even said, why do I, why do, I do what I don't want to do and I should do what I don't do? And, right? He had the same conflict. We all have the same conflict. The only hope you have is if God imputes righteousness to you. And how does he do it? By faith. And what do you need for faith? You need the word of God. You need to have the promise. You cannot believe. What was the first commandment? I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. If you make a God that's not God and you worship him, is God doesn't say, well, you know, he's doing it in ignorance, so I'm just going to accept that as worship. When he commanded, no. You know, we said before, Hindus have 100,000 gods. Have you ever been to a Hindu temple and see all these gods? See all these statues? Now, you're not going to see 100,000 of them, but... But they don't count. But I'm going I'm to add something there, and I'm not adding to the word. I'm just going to add something to think about. When you say, I believe in Jesus, who's your Jesus? Is it the Mormon Jesus? Jesus. Is it the yeah, is, is it the Jesus from Mexico City? Is it the Muslim Jesus? Is it the New Age Jesus? Or is it the Jesus of this book? Because it do make a difference, right? Thou shalt not bow down and serve them. If you thou shalt not make any any God in his image. There's only one who's in his image, and that was the one he sent. Jesus is the image of the unseen God, right? You can believe the wrong Jesus. You can, you can believe the wrong thing. If you didn't get it out of his word, that's why we got to be careful. You listen to the preacher expound or the preacher preach, make sure you take your word and look at it. Did it say that? And why would you change the revelation that God made about his son? Why would you change it and say, well, I don't believe that? 
You got your own reasoning, right? You believe a lie. What did he say? He said in the in last days, they'll believe a, a great lie, right? When the Antichrist comes. Anyway, work, walk perfect before me, be thou perfect. I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. Well, we read in Hebrews that he's also making the covenant with Isaac and Jacob right at the same time. They were heirs to the covenant. But neither one of them were born yet. Right? The fact that God made this covenant, you have a lot of people who claim to have been a prophet down through the history. You know, Zoroaster was a famous prophet of, in the Persian uh, dur- during the time of um, uh, Daniel, actually. But that's not a problem. You don't have a covenant with God. This is all about a covenant. In fact, the reason we have a new covenant is because we had an old covenant. And a covenant, the word covenant is berith in Hebrew, and it demands a blood sacrifice. The word demands a blood sacrifice. When you say covenant, berith, you have to have a blood sacrifice. <clears throat> Because that's what it means. In other words, he made a blood covenant with Abram. And all of these other false prophets, they don't have that covenant. Therefore, they're not legit. I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face. That must have hurt. No, he's praying. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Now, do you see, right before then, verse 1, he said, Be perfect, which he knows Abram can't do, right? But then in verse 4, it's kind of cool if you think about it. He says, But as for me, In other words, this is what I'm going to do. All you got to do, Abram, is receive it. As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. That's the same. He's getting the covenant the same way we do today. Jesus offers the covenant to us, and we receive it. That's all. We reach out, we take it. Just like a Christmas gift. We un- un- pat- unwrap it, right? Now it's ours. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. Thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Now here's something you might not know. Covenant rites, the practice of of covenanting in the ancient world was very common. Now not so much covenanting with God, because God made his covenant with Abram, right? Egyptians used to make a covenant with their false gods. They thought that they were, you know, that they had a covenant with their God. Pharaoh, I'm sure Pharaoh thought that he, he had a covenant with God. When you get to the New Testament, you see that a lot of these, and we talked about this, uh, a lot of these false deities, men would make a covenant with, with the goddess by having his testicles cut off. That's like, you can't turn around and say, well, you know, I... I don't want to do that anymore. It's too late. Right? But it's, 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 the covenant is void because she can't deliver. False gods cannot deliver. Neither, sh- and, and one thing that, the commonness of this covenanting, one thing that transpired, remember we talked about having the walls of the covenant, the, the animals were cut down the middle. They would walk in through the blood and they would meet each other. And one of the things is they would be given new names. We saw before Abram had a covenant with God. 
Now, God's going to do that very practice. He's going to change his name. And he does change his name because now he's in covenant. I don't want to lose, don't lose your place here, but I, I'll show you something in Revelation. Look in Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. You know what? Let's go to 11. Because I like this part in front of it. Behold. Because we started talking about this very thing. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. What do you mean? I'm going to write upon him the overcomer, my new name. I believe God is going to change our name. We're not going to be called by the same name that we were given by our our parents here on earth. When we get up to heaven, that's one of the first things going to happen. We're in the covenant, and God's going to change our name. He changed Jesus' name. I think he changed it to Jesus. (laughs) He called him the same. But he says, my new name, right? Actually, Revelation also says he's got a name written, the word of God, right? And then John uses that in his gospel. And I will make thee, back to Genesis 17, 6, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful. And I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. He already made that promise to Hagar. Nations, because she blessed multitudes to come out of Ishmael, right? And Ishmael is his seed. I will make thee exceedingly fruitful. He's already done that. If promises of Ishmael come to pass. I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. You know, 12 princes were supposed to come out of Ishmael's line. But he's speaking more Isaac, who hasn't been born yet. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee. Oh, look at this. And Jesus. Did you know that was in the Old Testament? Me and thee and Jesus? No, it doesn't say that. It says, and thy seed. Which the New Testament says, What did he mean? Thy seed. He said, thy seed, the seed was Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are part of Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Remember? I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant. In other words, not only is Jesus included in that line, just like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jesus is somewhere in there. But all of the descendants of the promise, all of Israel. In fact, did Paul say all of Israel will be saved? He says that in the book of Romans. All of Israel will be saved. But he does clarify that. He says, you know, a Jew outwardly is not necessarily a Jew inwardly. It doesn't say all uh, of the Jews are going to be saved. It says Israel's going to be saved, the true ones. Well, I think we can kind of glean from that about the church, too. We're all, you know, us in the church, we're all going to be in the covenant of everlasting life. But not everyone that's a, a Christian outwardly is one inwardly. In fact, remember when we taught on the tares? The tares and the wheat, and she says, somebody sowed these tares. Who's that? An enemy has done that, right? We couldn't tell the terror from the wheat. <clears throat> anyway, I will, verse 7, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant. How long will it last? Everlasting. It's forever. 
the promises God made to Abram or Abraham now because he's changing his name are eternal. This is what's so wonderful. And that's why <laughs> we get eternal life. That's why Jesus is a high priest forever. That's why he's the seed and he, he's the, the top of the line. Everything comes from him now. He's in, he's in charge. He will be in charge and, and forever. It's not like, oh, one of these days, Pastor Ed's going to succeed him. You know, Jesus is going to get so old he can't get, you know, make it out of bed to get to the throne. So now Pastor Ed's going to be in his chair. <laughs> With the fish hat. <laughs> and I will give unto thee. Oh, let me, uh, I skipped there. For an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Now, did it say, did, is he say, I will be a God to, to the, thy seed after thee? In other words, even after you've passed up, to, I will be a God to, the, to, to your seed, to, to the land of uh, the people of Israel, right? He's going to be a God to them. But the cool thing is here, in verse 4, remember we said, as for me, behold, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. As for me, in other words, I'm going to do it. And the promise was made to Abram before Isaac was born, before Jacob was born, before uh, he had 12 tr- uh, sons of Israel. In other words, they couldn't lose their covenant. They could always run back to God. And God is a merciful God. You know, we, we, we find that in the church. You know, we get saved and then we, we run away from God. A lot, a lot of people do. Especially kids grow up in the church and some of them fall away. They go to college or something and the professors beguile them. But the thing that they have is they were taught the word of God and they know inside they can come back after they mess up their life. And they do. A lot of them do. I messed up my life. You know, Brother Victor did. I know that. I will give unto thee, verse 8, and to thy seed after thee, the land. Whose land is it? He's going to give the land, this land of Canaan, that land, the promised land goes to Abram or Abraham, right? I will, I, will, uh, I will give you the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And he's still their God, and it's still their land. And, of course, the Muslims will say, well... He did give it to Abram, and then Abram gave it to his rightful firstborn, Ishmael. And where'd you get that? Oh, we got it out of the Quran. Oh, the same book that says Jesus isn't God? And God has no son? No, thank you. I just, I don't believe it. So the land of Canaan, he, may, he, he qualifies the land is the land of Canaan. That's what we call Israel right now. And we just had a vote. The United Nations almost unanimously voted against Israel having the capital of Jerusalem. I think only nine people voted, voted with the U.S. They all went against Israel. Israel was one of them that voted. <laughs> So that's down to eight, right? The people of this world, they don't want the Israel to have the land. Why? Because that makes the prophecy true. Because God said he would bring his people back into the land, and he did. Of course, most people don't believe that that has... In fact, most of the church doesn't believe that that's a a prophetic uh, fulfillment. And God said unto Abraham, Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, 
thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. Now he's going to tell them what he's going to make this part of the covenant. Because remember, when the, before when God made the covenant, and he, he had Abraham cut those animals in half. And it, it was only him walking through the blood. Remember that? A torch walked through the blood. But now he's going to let Abraham do a blood covenant with him. Because blood must be shed. And that's what this is. He said, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And you, or ye, shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. It shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you every man, child in your generation. He that is born in the house or bought with money or any stranger which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. How long? Forever, right? Now, we don't have to be circumcised in the flesh because the New Testament talks about the circumcision of the heart. We ought to pay attention because the circumcision of the flesh had to be done. And we're, a lot of us are just ignoring the circumcision of the heart. How do, how do you circumcise your heart? You can't do it. Only God only the Spirit of God can do it. And how does He do it? He takes the knife. And what's the knife? The Word of the Spirit, right? The Word of God. The Holy Spirit takes the Word. You got, you have to, have your heart has to be cut, circumcised with the Word of God. How, how can people say you don't need the Word of God to be saved? And look at this. Look what he warned. The uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Who? In other words, after the circumcision comes in, he tells him, everyone, all your, even your slaves. Even, even, even your uh, uh, servants, everyone that's born in your house, everyone needs to be circumcised. And if not, they're cut off. And then all the way down through history, the Jews practice circumcision, right? And they get to the time of Jesus, and they got this idea they're saved because they were circumcised. Was Abraham saved because he was circumcised? Was the promise made to, to Abraham because he was circumcised or before he was circumcised? Before. Was the promise made to you before your heart was circumcised? Sure it was. God, didn't, God does not tell you to clean up your act before you can come to him, Right? But this part in 11 here, he said, it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. You shall circumcise the flesh of your force. It shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. Now, let me tell you what the, the word token of the covenant. The word token is sign. It's the sign of the covenant. It's the sign that you're in covenant with me. In fact, it's the same word. Remember Noah? We talked about Noah. Noah had... The sign in the sky, what it was it? A rainbow. Noah couldn't put the sign in the sky. God had to do it, right? God made a covenant not only with Noah, but every person that was on the earth, which was only eight, and then all the animals. The animal did you know God made a covenant with all the animals that were rescued? He said, I will never flood the earth again. Now, here's the thing. that You know, these, uh, these goofy 
so-called, who they think they're brilliant theologians, right? And they look at it and they say, well, I don't believe that there was a worldwide flood. I believe it was local. Okay, let's, let's take that. Let's say, okay, the flood of Noah was actually local, which that would negate the whole story of only eight surviving, right? But also, it negates the promise. God said he'll never bring a flood like he did before. Well, if it was local, has there been any local floods since? Sure. Man, you know, just one little lie, one little error. Look at, look at the, the, the damage it does to the gospel, to the word of God, to the promises of God. The token is a sign of your covenant. Now, for us, we have a sign. And the sign is the blood. And the sign is so important, Jesus said, unless you do this, you can't have any part of me. You want to know what it is? Unless you eat my body and drink my blood. Now, he wasn't cannibalistic. He said, unless, unless you partake of this communion meal. Because he said, the bread represents my body. The blood or the wine represents my blood or the grape juice. I believe you can do it either way. But unless you do that, you have no part of me. To me, that makes that awful important. And I don't, and I never have completely understood it because, you know, you got the Catholic Church and they, they call this transubstantiation like the, the, the priest does this woo magic or something and, and this, is, this becomes the actual body and the blood. In fact, they, they say that they, 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 they saw manifestations where they were, people were taking communion and all of a sudden they were eating flesh and blood was dripping out of their mouth. That's stupid. Jesus offered the bread and the blood, but he said, there's something more to it than just a symbol. Something happens when we, in faith, partake of communion. I don't know if you've experienced it, but I have. I'm not saying bow down and worship the, the cup and the, the wafer because I don't believe it's God. That's Catholics believe that. I don't believe that. But I do believe that he set up the bread and the blood as a token of the covenant. Now, he, he called Abram. Let me show you why you have a token of the covenant, the sign of the covenant. He, he gave Abraham, we saw in the last, uh, when we were talking about the, uh, the other thing, when, when he uh, did walk, had the blood walk, talked about that. Uh, and in that, he told Abram that his descendants were going to go into a terrible place, into a nation that was basically going to enslave them for 400 years. And that happened, Right? Remember when we were uh, in Hebrews, I think it was in the 6th chapter, and uh, we talked about uh, God wanting... In fact, let, let's go there, and we'll, we'll come right back here, but let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6. Now, as I read this, you'll you'll remember it. Verse 13, for when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. Remember that? Saying, surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. 
wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie we might have a strong consolation who have fled for hope or fled for reference to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. We say he's the reason he made covenant, blood covenant with Abraham. And so that was the token. The token to Abraham wouldn't be that every time he was going to need faith, that he would butcher a bunch of animals again and walk through the blood. That would have been pretty time consuming. No, he made it so simple. He said, every time, every time you go to the bathroom and you look down, providing your belly didn't get too big, you're going to be reminded, right? You're going to be reminded you have a covenant with God. Wow. Every time. And that's why, this what, to, to him it was the covenant of circumcision, the circumcision, but to us it's communion. Every time you think about the body and the blood of Christ being given to you, that should affect your faith just like the circumcision. And you didn't even have to have any pain involved. In fact, now he's going to turn around and have himself circumcised, and he's over 100 years old. Can you imagine a 120-year-old guy? We don't even have one in our church. Could you imagine if we say, you're going to be the example. We're going to circumcise you after 120 years. That would hurt. Abraham comes back and he says, God said everybody in the house has to be circumcised. You know, all the servants and everyone has to be, not the females, but all the men had to be circumcised. I mean, Abraham made this choice. He's going to go ahead and go with the circumcision. Like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But everybody else in his family, all his servants... They have to submit themselves to the circumcision. They're like, I don't know that I believe in this God at all. You know, we blame God when it get, you know, when when it, the ride gets a little rough. We start whining, just like they did through the wilderness. We whine about this. We whine about that. At least you didn't have to cut your own thing, right? Could you imagine doing it yourself? Especially if you're fat and you can't see it. And yeah, that really suck. He, why did he do that on the or, male organ? He did it so that every time a child, every time the seed would come out, it went through the covenant. Because the covenant had to go on to all the seed, right? And so every time. The seed came out. It went through a circle. And that was the token of the covenant. I see God saying, Abram, some of the things that you're going to have to face in life, you can't do it in the natural. You're going to, you lose faith. Unless you can look down at the token and say, I have a covenant with God. Think about this. When David went after Goliath, those are the exact words he said. You uncircumcised. You uncircumcised. You don't have a covenant with God. Now, I don't know that, you know, he he showed what he had there, but I don't think it doesn't say that. But he had a cup. That was what he was talking about. I have a covenant with God. The token of the covenant was around his uh, organ, right? I thank God I don't have to do that. I got communion. 
I, I'll recommend this, and you, you know, you take it or, or not, I don't know. And I don't even know what Pastor thinks about it. But I'm going to just, this is my opinion. This is my opinion. When you've got something that you're really trying to believe, you're really trying to believe the promise, first find the promise. Don't try to believe something that's not in the book. Make sure you got the promise. And then sit down and take communion. Take communion. I mean, whether you do it at the church or you do it at home. Now, my wife and I both believe that. So we don't take communion enough. Anyway, that's your token of your covenant. And verse 15, and God said, chapter 17, verse 15, Genesis, and God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah. I'm glad he changed her name because I always refer to her as Sarah. In fact, it's kind of hard to say Sarai. Sarah. Sarah shall be her name. He changed her name too. Why? Because she's in covenant. She's part of the covenant. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. And Abraham fell upon his face. He was in prayer again. He fell on his face and he laughed. Abraham is is laughing at this. He laughed and said... In his heart shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said, now, it's funny, but his child's going to be named Isaac, right? You know what the name means? Laughter. So every time they called him Isaac, they remembered the covenant. Isn't that cool the way God set that up? Every time you call Isaac and he goes, here I am. Every time you call him, every time the word comes out of your mouth, Isaac, you think about the covenant that he made, laughter, the supernatural birth. Every time you think about Christmas, you think about Jesus Let's leave all the goofy stuff that goes with it. What's, what do we want to know? Jesus was born of a virgin, right? It was a miracle. That's what we want. We want to know what's in this book. I don't see 12 reindeer or 8 reindeer in the book. But I do see 12 apostles. Verse 18, and, and, you know, I told you about chapter 53 in Isaiah, right? Where in Isaiah, it talk, uh, the, the, literally, it talks about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But embedded in the, in the, in the uh, Bible codes is every name of the 12 apostles. And that is significant. That is absolutely impossible to have happened by chance. And then God did it, and he didn't even tell us. Finally, just uh, not too many years ago, they discovered it accidentally. But you know, if you go back and you you look for, uh, you know, you look for uh, the name of the apostles and you see them embedded in there. But if you look for Rudolph, it's not there. Why? What's their names? Rudolph and... Pastor probably knows all eight of them. No, I, I, I don't even know them offhand. Dasher and, yeah, now I know them from the song. Dasher and Dancer and Prancer and Vixen, Comet and Cupid, Donner and Blitzen. And the most famous one of all had a red nose, which shows that he drank the wine. But it's not in the Bible. Those names are not in the Bible. And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. When God says Sarah's going to have a child, Abraham laughs and he's almost struggling to believe. He said, I'm 100 years old and she's 90. How about I already have Ishmael? Let's use him. 
right? Oh, Abraham said unto God, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him. Does it say he's going to establish it with Ishmael? Then we don't need the Koran. Because the Koran says he did establish it with Ishmael. So by accepting the Koran, you reject the truth. Now, some people think, well, you, like the Pope, he thinks, well, uh, you know, the Koran is a word of God and uh, the Bible is a word of God. The Old Testament is and New Testament is. And, well, that kind of makes me lose faith in the Pope. That's not the only reason I lost faith in the Pope. I will establish my covenant with him, with Isaac, for an everlasting covenant. Everlasting. That means forever. It doesn't change because 580 years after Christ, 560 years after Christ, Muhammad shows up and has a new revelation. I'm sorry, you're late. You're too late. Jesus already came. Sent forth his apostles, wrote the New Testament. Hello? Right? I mean, you might want to believe Buddha. Buddha, I think, was uh, BC, uh, 500 BC. But to believe in Islam, which is a thousand years after that, five over um, 600 years after Christ, come on. I'm going to make him uh, establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. In other words, he sees Abram's praying. This is his son. If you have two sons, do you think uh, having two sons, do you think he loved Isaac more than he loved Ishmael? I think he loved Ishmael. It was his firstborn. But it wasn't the firstborn of the promise. God didn't even count him as part of the covenant. But he did say this. He said, as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him. will make him fruitful. will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget. And I will make him a great nation. But, verse 21, my covenant will I establish with Isaac which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. That's loaded. Because here, he's been trying to have a kid with her. She's, what, 90 years old? I don't know when they were married, but she, he's been trying to have a child with her ever since. And just because he went with the Egyptian girl doesn't mean he stopped trying. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abram, and Abram took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were brought with his money, bought with his money, every male among the men of Abram's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day as God had said unto him. Woo! There's a lot of circumcisions going around. What did they do with all the foreskins? Doesn't say. And Abraham was 90 years old and nine, 99 when he was circumcised in the flesh of the foreskin. It's almost 100. 99 years old. And God has him do this, right? And it, it, but he did it immediately. When God, made the, when God told him to, he did it that day. The same day. It says the same day. The se- in fact, verse 23, then the self same day as God had said unto him. Now, you got people out there that they hear the gospel. I got time. They hear the gospel. I got time. I might do it. I might not. I want to sow my wild oats. But the way we should be responding is like Abraham responded. That, that's what faith does. Faith hears God say, do it. And the self same day, it's done. Right? What if we lived our life like that? What if we lived our life like that? And I, I, 
again, I'll inject. I, I think if we would go before God in all sincerity, have that little communion, and just because that makes you reflect, realize that, hey, I have a covenant with God. This, all these promises, these are covenant promises. We need to start drawing closer to God and do the self same day, do what God said to do. You know, that sin that, you know, you've sinned and, and then you repented and then you came back, back to the sin and then you repented and then you came back to the sin and you repented. You're not doing, you're not obeying the self same day. I mean, when he did it, cut. There's no going back. There's no, go, you can't grow it back. Right? It doesn't grow back. That's how we need to be with our life. When he said, thou walk perfect before me, now he knows you can't do it. He knows you're going to slip up. But how much better would your reward be? How much greater will your the day when you're raptured into heaven? How much greater will it be if we say enough is enough? I'm not allowing Satan to have any more in me. I'm done with it. And it's different from each one of us. And maybe maybe you're completely you have no thought of anything you need to turn, but it'll come. You'll have some temptation somewhere. And hopefully when you do, you'll remember this word. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old. Can you imagine taking a 13-year-old and saying, I'm going to do this to you because I heard from God? (laughs) How many 13-year-old boys have enough respect for their father? He says, come here, this is what God told me to do. Right? He was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his, his foreskin. How old are the Muslims when they're, when they're circumcised? 13. They, got, they carried on the custom. In the self same day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael his son. And also what happened is he had his name changed and Sarah had her name changed, and all the men of his house. Now, Pastor, last week you said, estimated that there was at least a thousand people living in, in Abraham's house. And basing upon that, 50% of them were men. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, there's a lot of screaming. Yeah, that's right. All the men of his house, born in the house and bought with money of the stranger, were circumcised with him. Remember, the circumcision today, it doesn't apply. I mean, you can be circumcised. You don't have to be circumcised. It's the heart. The Bible says circumcision of the heart. That's what we need to be concerned about. 